Hello. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I have spoken once in this auditorium before. It's the coolest auditorium with the best acoustics. So it's nice to be back here. And I really would like to thank Parnassus Books. Um, I had the opportunity to go to that store today. And let me tell you why that is the best bookstore on the planet. They have store dogs. Like, you can go in there and lie down with the dog, which is what I did today. It was the best moment, really, of my book tour. So tonight, I'm really happy to be here talking about leaving time. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about where this book came from, and then I'm going to do a short reading, and then I'm going to go back to talking and tell you about some of the research that I did when I was preparing to write Leaving Time. This story actually began because my youngest daughter, my youngest child, who is a daughter, was getting ready to go away to college. And we were getting ready to be empty nesters. And you know what? It freaked me out more than I thought it was going to. And um, you know, I was getting really upset about it. And I happened to read in an article somewhere that a mother and a daughter elephant stay together their entire lives in the wild until one of them dies. And I read that fact and I thought, why don't we do it that way? It's much more humane. And I started to think about that and I started to learn a little bit more about elephants. And as I learned about their amazing powers of cognition, their sense of empathy, the way that they grieve, I realized that I had found a perfect metaphor for a book about how the people that we love never really leave us. So I created this story about a woman named Alice Metcalf, who is an elephant researcher studying grief in elephants. And she runs a fictional elephant sanctuary with her husband until one night a horrible tragedy occurs. An elephant tramples and kills a caregiver. That same night, Alice Metcalf vanishes off the face of the earth. And the only witness is her three-year-old daughter, Jenna, who has no recollection of what happened. The book opens 10 years later when Jenna is 13 years old. And Jenna has never believed that her mother would willingly leave her. She pours over her academic journals trying to find some clues. And she decides that she is going to enlist the help of a failed psychic and an alcoholic detective so that the three of them together can find her mother. Knowing very well that what she uncovers along the way might be a lot of answers she's not quite ready to hear. So what I'm going to do now is just pause and give a brief reading. You're going to get to hear two of the narrators that I was telling you about. You're going to hear from both Jenna and from Serenity, who is that failed psychic. So this is Jenna. My first memory is white at the edges, like a photo taken with too bright a flash. My mother is holding spun sugar on a cone, cotton candy. She raises her finger to her lips. This is our secret and tears off a tiny piece. When she touches it to my lips, the sugar dissolves. My tongue curls around her finger and sucks hard. E sweetie, she tells me, sweet. This is not my bottle. It's not a taste I know, but it's a good one. Then she leans down and kisses my forehead. Ooh, sweetie, she says, sweetheart. I can't be more than nine months old. This is pretty amazing, really, because most kids trace their first memories to somewhere between the ages of two and five. That doesn't mean that babies are little amnesiacs. They have memories long before they have language, but weirdly can't access them once they start talking. Maybe the reason I remember the cotton candy episode is because my mother was speaking Osa, which isn't our language, but one she picked up when she was working on her doctorate in South Africa. Or maybe the reason I have this random memory is a trade-off my brain made, because I can't remember the details of the night my mother disappeared. My mother was a scientist, and for a span of time, she studied memory. It was part of her work on post-traumatic stress and elephants. You know that old adage that elephants never forget? Well, it's fact. Her official published findings were that memory is linked to strong emotion and that negative moments are like scribbling with permanent marker on the wall of the brain. But there's a fine line between a negative moment and a traumatic one. Negative moments get remembered. Traumatic ones get forgotten or so warped that they're unrecognizable or else they turn into the big bleak nothing I get in my head when I try to focus on that night. Here's what I know. One, I was three. Two, my mother was found on the sanctuary property, unconscious, about a mile south of a dead body. 
This was in the police reports. She was taken to the hospital. Three, I am not mentioned in the police reports. Afterward, my grandmother took me to stay at her place because my father was frantically dealing with a dead elephant caregiver and a wife who'd been knocked out cold. Four, sometime before dawn, my mother regained consciousness and vanished from the hospital without any staff seeing her go. Five, I never saw her again. Sometimes I think of my life as two train cars hitched together at the moment of my mom's disappearance, but when I try to see how they connect, there's a jarring on the track that jerks my head back around. I know I used to be a little girl who ran around like a wild thing while my mother took endless, endless notes about elephants. Now I'm a kid who's too serious for her age and too smart for her own good. I don't really have friends at school. I sit at the lunch table on the far end, eating whatever my grandmother's packed me, while the cool girls, who I swear to God call themselves the icicles, chatter about how they're going to grow up and work for OPI and make up nail polish color names based on famous movies. My gentlemen prefer blondes. A fuchsia good men. <laughs> Maybe I've tried to join the conversation once or twice, but when I do, they look at me like they've smelled something bad and then go back to whatever they were talking about. The memories on the other side of my mother's disappearance are just as spotty. I can tell you about my new bedroom at my grandma's place, which had a big girl bed, my first. I can tell you about visiting my father. The halls at the psychiatric hospital smelled like ammonia and pee, and even when my grandma urged me to talk to him and I climbed up on the bed, he didn't speak or move. Tears leaked out of his eyes as if it were a natural and expected phenomenon, the way a cold can of soda sweats on a summer day. I remember the nightmares I had, which weren't really nightmares, but just me being awakened from a dead sleep by Mora's loud trumpeting. Even after my grandma came running into my room and explained to me that the matriarch elephant lived hundreds of miles away now in a new sanctuary in Tennessee, I had this nagging sense that Mora was trying to tell me something, and that if I only spoke her language as well as my mother had, I'd understand. All I have left of my mother is her research. I pour over her journals because I know one day the words will rearrange themselves on a page and point me toward her. She taught me, even in absentia, that all good science starts with a hypothesis, which is just a hunch dressed up in fancy vocabulary. And my hunch is this. She would never have left me behind. Not willingly. If it's the last thing I do, I'm going to prove it. I started actively searching for my mother when I was 11. Mostly, I was dismissed or pitied by the people I approached. The Boone Police Department refused to help me because I was 13. The New England Elephant Sanctuary, of course, was completely disbanded, and the one person who could tell me more about what had happened to the caregiver who died, namely my dad, wasn't even able to give his own name or day of the week, much less details of the incident that caused his psychotic break. So I decided to take matters into my own hands. I tried to hire a private detective, but learned quickly they don't do work pro bono like some lawyers. Almost every online search engine find, to find missing people costs money and requires a credit card, neither of which I had. Today, for the first time, I'm going to a psychic. She lives in the part of town that my grandmother always tells me to stay away from. I'm nervous about leaving my bike on the street since I don't have a lock for it, so I haul it into the corridor, which smells like beer and sweat. The walls are covered with peeling velveteen wallpaper. Yellow stains bloom on the ceiling. There's a rickety side table propped up on a phone book for balance. On it is a china dish filled with business cards. Serenity Jones, psychic. I can hear the muffled voices of two women on the other side of the interior door. With the bike frame balanced against my hip, I press my ear to listen. Your husband is here now, and he wants you to know you can trust your heart. There is a pause. That doesn't sound like Bert. Of course not. That was someone else who's watching over you. I can't help it. I snort. The bicycle and I crash into the little table, and the bowl falls off and shatters. The door is yanked open, and I look up from where I'm crouched in the pretzel of bike frame, trying to gather the pieces. The woman is tall, with a swirl of pink cotton candy hair piled high on her head. Are you Serenity? Who's asking? Shouldn't you know? I'm prescient, not omniscient. If I were omniscient, this would be Park Avenue, and I'd be squirreling my dividends away in the Caymans. Her voice sounds overused, like a couch with its springs busted. Then she notices the broken bits of china in my hand. Are you kidding me? That was my grandmother's scrying bowl. I have no idea what a scrying bowl is. I just know I'm in deep trouble. I I'm sorry, it was an accident. Do you have 
any idea how old this is. It's a family heirloom. Thank baby Jesus my mother isn't alive to see this. I'll pay for your bowl. Your Girl Scout cookie money can't cover the cost of an antique from 1858. I'm not selling Girl Scout cookies, I tell her. I'm here for a reading. That stops her in her tracks. I don't do kids. I'm older than I look. This is a fact. Everyone assumes I'm still in fifth grade instead of eighth. The woman who is inside having a reading suddenly is framed in the doorway too. Serenity, are you all right? I'm fine. Serenity smiles tightly at me. I can't help you. I beg your pardon, the client says. Not you, Mrs. Langham, Serenity answers. And then she mutters to me, if you don't leave right now, I'll call the cops and press charges. Maybe Mrs. Langham doesn't want a psychic who's mean to kids. Maybe she just doesn't want to be around when the police come. For whatever reason, she looks at Serenity as if she's about to say something, but then edges past us and bolts. Oh, great, Serenity mutters. Now you owe me for a priceless heirloom and the 10 bucks I just lost. I'll pay double. I have $68. It's every penny I've made this year from babysitting, and I'm saving it for a private eye. I'm not convinced Serenity is the real deal, but I'd be willing to part with $20 to find out. Her eyes glint when she hears that. For you, I'll make an age exception. She sits down heavily on the couch and gestures at a chair. What's your name? Jenna Metcalf. All right, Jenna, let's get this over with. She takes the tarot deck and begins to shuffle it. What I'm about to tell you during this reading might not make sense right now, but remember the information because one day you might hear something and realize what the spirits were trying to tell you today. She says this the same way flight attendants tell you how to buckle and release the latch on your seatbelt. Then she hands the deck to me to cut into three piles. What do you want to know? Who's got a crush on you? If you're going to get an A in English? Where you should apply to college? I don't care about any of that. I hand the deck back, unbroken. My mother disappeared 10 years ago, and I want you to help me find her. I don't do missing people, Serenity says, in a voice that doesn't allow even a sliver of butt. You don't do kids. You don't do missing people. What exactly do you do? She narrows her eyes. You want energy alignment? No problem. Tarot? Step right up. Communicating with someone who's passed? I'm your girl. But I do not do missing people. You're a psychic. Different psychics have different gifts, she says. Precognition, aura reading, telepathy. Just because I've been given a taste doesn't mean I get the whole smorgasbord. She vanished 10 years ago, I continue, as if Serenity hasn't spoken. I was three. Most missing people disappear because they want to. But not all. In all the ways I've imagined this meeting going down, this was not one of them. Why wouldn't you want to help me if you can? Because I am not mother freaking Teresa, she snaps. Her face turns tomato red. I wonder if she's seen her own imminent death by high blood pressure. I'm truly sorry to hear about your mother. Maybe someone else can tell you what you want to hear. Who? I have no idea. It's not like we hang out at the paranormal cafe on Wednesday nights. She moves to the door, holding it wide open, my cue to leave. If you won't find her for me, can you at least tell me if she's dead? I can't believe I've asked that until the words are hanging between us, like curtains that keep us from seeing each other clearly. For a second, I think about grabbing my bike and running out the door before I have to hear the answer. Serenity shudders as if I've hit her with a taser. She's not. As she closes the door in my face, I wonder if this is a flat-out lie, too. This is Serenity. I was eight years old when I realized the world was full of people no one else could see. There was the boy who crawled beneath the jungle gym at my school, staring up my skirt when I swung on the monkey bars. There was the old black woman who smelled like lilies and sang me to sleep. Sometimes when my mother and I were walking down a street, I felt like a salmon swimming upstream. It was that hard to keep myself from bumping into the hundreds of people coming at me. In college, I did readings for $5 during the summer up at Old Orchard Beach in Maine. I was 28, working as a waitress at a local diner, when the main gubernatorial candidate came in for a photo op with his family. His little girl hopped up on one of the school's stools. Boring, huh, I said. How about some hot chocolate? As her hand brushed mine to take the mug, I felt the strongest jolt of black I had ever felt. When the candidate's wife ducked into the ladies' room, I followed. She held out her hand to shake, thinking I was another voter to charm. This is going to sound crazy, she said but you need to get your daughter tested for leukemia. A week later, the candidate's wife came back to the diner. She grabbed my arm. How did you know? That might have been the end of it, but the candidate's wife happened to be the sister of the producer of the Clio show. 
America loved Cleo, a talk show host who'd grown up in the projects of Washington Heights. When Cleo read a book, so did every woman in America. When she gave away fuzzy bamboo bathrobes for Christmas gifts, the company website crashed. And when she invited me onto the show to do a reading for her, my life changed overnight. I told Cleo things any idiot could have guessed, that she would become more successful, that Forbes would list her as the richest woman in the world that year. But then I blurted out, your daughter's looking for you. Cleo's best friend, who was part of the show that day, said, Cleo doesn't have a daughter. This was true, she was a single woman, but tears welled in Cleo's eyes. Actually, I do. It was one of the biggest news stories of the year. Cleo admitted to being date raped as a 16 year old and sent to a convent in Puerto Rico where the baby was born and put up for adoption. Her, her rating skyrocketed, she won an Emmy. And as a reward, her production company gave me my own syndicated show. I had a special connection when it came to finding kids. I went into homes where children had been abducted and tried to sense a trail for law enforcement to follow. So when Senator McCoy's boy was kidnapped during fall sweeps, I knew I had a once in a lifetime chance to become the greatest psychic of all time. After all, what better endorsement for my gift than a politician who was probably gonna be president one day. But that day on the show, when I told the McCoys I had a vision of their little boy alive and well, I lied. I didn't have a vision of their boy. The only thing I was seeing was an Emmy. It's been nearly a decade since I had a true electrifying psychic thought, but I've been able to scrape by thanks to people like Mrs. Langham, who comes every week to try to connect with her dead husband, Bert. The reason she keeps returning is that it turns out I have a skill for faking readings just as much as I once had a skill for legitimately performing them. The basic premise is this, people who want a psychic reading are highly motivated to have it be successful. We are a race that sees the Virgin Mary in the cut stump of a tree, that hears Paul is dead when a Beatles song is played backward. The same intricate human mind that makes sense of the nonsensical is the same human mind that can believe a fake psychic. So how do I play the game? I pay attention. I look at how the client is dressed and how she speaks and I make assumptions about her upbringing. I let the client feed me rope I can run with. You'd be surprised how people feel the need to fill in all the gaps in a conversation. Does this make me a con man? I guess that's one way to look at it. I prefer to think of myself as Darwinian. I'm adapting so that I can survive. Today, however, has been an absolute disaster. I lost a good client, my grandmother's scrying bowl, and my composure, all within the past hour, thanks to a scrawny kid and a rusty bicycle. When Jenna Metcalf leaves, I take a Xanax. By three o'clock, I'm blissfully unconscious on the couch. When I fall asleep, my mind is a kaleidoscope of color. I see a flag whipping across my field of vision, but then realize it's not a flag. It's a blue scarf wound around the neck of a woman whose face I can't see. She's lying on her back near a sugar maple, immobile, being trampled by an elephant. At second glance, I realize maybe she isn't being trampled. The elephant's going out of its way to not step on her, lifting one of its back feet and moving it over the woman's body without touching it. The elephant's trunk strokes her cheek, her throat, her forehead, before slipping the scarf free and lifting it so that the wind carries it off like a rumor. I wake up with a start, disoriented and surprised to be thinking of elephants, wondering at the storm that still seems to be filling my head, but it's not thunder, it's someone banging on the front door. I already know who it's gonna be before I open it. Before you freak out, I'm not here to convince you to find my mother, Jenna Metcalf announces, pushing past me. It's just that I left something behind. She starts opening up drawers where I keep my stamps, my secret stash of Oreos, and my takeout menus. Do you mind? I say. But Jenna is ignoring me, her hand stuck between the cushions of the couch. I knew it was here, she says with relief. And like floss, she pulls out the blue scarf from my dream. Seeing it, three-dimensional and close enough to touch, makes me feel a little less crazy. I'd only been incorporating a scarf this kid must have been wearing into my subconscious. But there's other information in her dream that makes no sense. The onion skin wrinkles of an elephant's hide, the ballet of its trunk. My whole life, this is how I've defined the paranormal. Can't understand it, can't explain it, can't deny it. Sorry I bothered you, Jenna says, or whatever. This is probably crazy, but was your mother in the circus or something? I don't know why, but there's something important about elephants. I haven't had a true psychic thought in seven years. Seven years. I tell myself this one is coincidence, luck, or the after effects of the burrito I ate for lunch. 
When Jenna turns around, her face is washed with an expression that's equal parts shock and wonder. I know in that moment that she was meant to find me and that I am going to find her mother. Thank you. <laughs> so now I get to talk to you a little bit about some of the research behind this book, which was phenomenal. Um, as you can probably tell, you will learn an awful lot about elephants by reading this book as you begin to piece together the story of Alice Metcalf. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. I had the very good fortune to work with several people who taught me a lot about elephants. I started here at the Elephant Sanctuary in Hohenwald, where the, um, the staff and the caregivers were kind enough to take me into their world, to teach me how you go about running a sanctuary, to introduce me to the amazing elephants who they have given an amazing retirement to, basically. It's the best retirement home in the world if you're an, elef an elephant. Um, and after I left the Elephant Sanctuary, I then went to the wild to see the way that herds behave out there. And in Botswana, I worked for a week with a researcher who studies elephant migration in the Thule block of Botswana. Uh, and everything you read in Leaving Time is a true story that came either from something that happened in the wild or something that happened to an elephant in the elephant sanctuary. So I'm going to give you tonight a crash course on elephants, some of which you probably already know, but a lot of which I bet you do not. Elephants, as I'm sure you know, are our largest land mammals. They weigh seven to 10,000 pounds, and they're herbivores. You can tell elephants apart from each other by tusks, by voice, by personality, uh, by hair, and by their ears. The ridges on an elephant's ears are different from each other. They're kind of like our fingerprints. No two are the same. And so when you're in the wild, that's what researchers do. They draw the ears of the elephant to be able to know who they're looking at within the herd. They live for up to 50 to 70 years in the wild, and they live in um, families of two to 10 adult females who are led by a matriarch. The matriarch is usually the oldest and the largest female of the group. Babies in the wild are allomothered. That means it takes a village to raise a child. All the aunties and cousins, all of these, these juvenile elephants help raise the calves together. Males get chased out of the herd when they're about 13 years old. And it happens when they hit a period called must. Must is the Hindi word for madness, and it is basically when they discover girls. We used to think that bull elephants were really solitary and just wandered around by themselves, but now they know that they form these little clumps of males who sort of um, older males teach the younger males how they're supposed to behave. It's kind of like little, I don't know, like a frat in apprenticeship or something like that. Um, we know that elephants have a very large and complex brain. They are capable of learning, of remembering, of feeling fear, pain, loss. There are sanctuaries in Africa that have no fly zones over them because the elephants inside them freaked out so badly when they heard helicopters. And yet for many of the elephants that were in these sanctuaries, the only helicopters they ever would have heard were 40 to 50 years earlier during the culls in Africa when uh, the elephants were being shot for population control and these elephants were left orphaned and brought to the sanctuaries. We know that elephants show empathy. Joyce Poole, who is an incredibly famous elephant researcher, talks about this time that she witnessed uh, two elephants standing near an electric fence. The fence had been turned off, but when one elephant reached toward the fence, the one beside her flinched, as if she knew it was coming. We know that elephants refuse to leave the sick and the injured behind. That doesn't just happen in the wild, it happens in a sanctuary setting as well. We also know that elephants do something that previously only humans have been known to do, which is to show cross-species empathy, like the way you or I would take care of a dog and bring him to the vet if he were sick. That's not something that happens with other species. They tend to just take care of their own if they even do that. Well, elephants take care of other species. There are numerous examples where elephants in the wild have helped a rhino calf get out of a well or a pool of mud when the other rhino can't do it themselves. There is not an evolutionary advantage to this behavior. In fact, there's an evolutionary disadvantage to this behavior because that rhino baby is going to grow up and could ultimately hurt that elephant. And yet they still do it over and over again. We also know that the relationship of elephants lasts a lifetime. The story that I really like to tell is one from the elephant sanctuary about two elephants named Shirley and Jenny. 
Jenny, and I'm hoping many of you know this, living in the area near the sanctuary, Jenny was an elephant who was living at the sanctuary, had been there for some time, when Shirley was brought into the sanctuary to live out a very peaceful retirement. And when Shirley first came out and was exploring the space by herself, which is the way they do everything at the sanctuary, it's very elephant-centric. Nobody forces them out of a trailer, they come out on their own time. When Shirley came out and went into the barn and saw Jenny, she was trying to get to Jenny, and Jenny was trying to get to her. And they began to bang on the bars of the stalls between them really hard and, and like roar. They were trying so hard to get to each other. So the caregiver talked to the um, owner of the sanctuary who came down and made the decision to open up the gate between them. And as soon as the gate was opened up, they immediately came over to each other. They're roaring even more. They're touching each other all over the place. The next day, the two of them walked out into the land of the sanctuary from the barn, shoulder to shoulder. They stayed that way literally for years. They were always together in what looked very much like a mother-daughter relationship. When Jenny used to take naps during the day, Shirley would stand over her, making her body like a a table, which is the posture that we see with uh, elephant mothers in the wild over their calves. What they did not know, but what Shirley and Jenny knew, was that they were in the same circus when Jenny was a calf and Shirley was in her 20s. They had been separated for 22 years, but they recognized each other. Isn't that the coolest story ever? <laughs> They're awesome. Everyone wants a friend like that, right? Um, another story that kind of illustrates that relationship also comes from the wild. Janetta, who is the researcher that I was studying with when I was in Botswana, told me a story about an elephant, a male who was a young bull. He was in his early 20s, and his trunk had gotten caught in a snare. Now, an elephant without a trunk cannot live. They, they needed to do way too much. And so they knew they had to euthanize the elephant. However, at the time, the only people qualified to do that were wildlife management rangers. So they called wildlife management, and wildlife management sent out a very inexperienced guy to come and shoot the elephant. The humane way to shoot an elephant is behind its ear, because it goes right into the brain. If you shoot an elephant here in the skull, not much happens. The bullet gets stuck because they have a honeycomb skull, so there's just too much ridge work to go through. It doesn't really do much. Anyway, this guy came and he shot the elephant in the skull. So now the elephant is bleeding from his trunk, which is semi-attached, and bellowing, and he's been shot in the head, and he's in severe pain, and he's basically screaming. And all of a sudden, from over a rise, comes a thunderous, giant matriarch charging that vehicle. She comes for the guy who shot the bullet. They back up, trying to get away, and she immediately rushes over to this bull and starts touching him and trying to soothe him. Well, that was his mother. She had not had him in her herd for about a decade, but she knew his cries, and she came and stayed with him until he died. Pretty remarkable, right? Elephants, we know, have very elaborate grief rituals. Um, we know that elephants who come across the bones of other elephants in the wild will get very quiet, very somber, their ears droop, their tails droop, total behavioral change. They pick up the bones and they rub them in their trunk. They take their very sensitive hind feet and just rub them like this, rub over the bones. And they spend a lot of time examining these bones. They do not act this way around the bones of any other animals, just elephants. We know that they will return to the site where an elephant died for many years after its death. They just come by. Again, you see that behavioral change, the ears droop. The tail droops, they get a little quiet and reflective, and they all kind of bunch together. And they stay for a little while, almost maybe like we would at a gravesite, paying our respects, and then they move on and continue with their day. We know that they have broken into research facilities where researchers are using bones, stolen the bones of an elephant, and brought it back to the site of that elephant's death. That happens a lot in Botswana. And um, we also know this is not only something that happens in the wild. We see grief in a sanctuary setting, too. Sissy is an elephant at the sanctuary 
who uh, she's had, she had a really tough life. There was a lot that happened to her over the course of her life. Uh, she survived the 1981 Gainesville flood. She was basically submerged in this raging river for 24 hours, and they found her because her trunk was wrapped around a tree. They got her out of the water, and you would have thought that was awful enough, but then she wound up going to multiple zoos, including one where she was very badly treated and beaten. And after that, she was eventually brought to the sanctuary. And she had a really hard time socializing because she had a really crappy life. And she took to carrying a tire, kind of like a security blanket. Everywhere she went, she would carry this tire. Well, eventually, she did wind up bonding with some other elephants. She became very good friends with two elephants named Tina and Winky. And Tina, unfortunately, got sick. And when she got sick and began to go to start to die, Sissy and Winky kept a vigil over her. And after Tina did die and was buried, Sissy and Winky stayed by the grave for a couple of days. And Sissy took her tire and placed it right on the grave, kind of like we'd place a wreath. And she left it there for a few days as if she knew that her friend needed it right now more than she did. And then after a few days, she took the tire away and she left after she had paid those respects. It's really hard to not anthropomorphize when you see that kind of behavior. And elephants do it over and over and over. Which is why, if you start to fall in love with elephants, like I did, it's even more devastating to learn how threatened they are in the wild today. We already know they're threatened in captive settings, and that's why it's great that we have places like the Elephant Sanctuary and Paws, which can rescue at least some elephants in this country. But what's really scary is that right now, because of poaching and because of a demand for ivory in Southeast Asia, 38,000 elephants are being killed a year in Africa. At that rate, in 10 years, there will be no wild elephants in Africa. And I don't know about you, but I, I really want my grandkids to be able to see real wild elephants at some point. The way you know that a population is being poached is that there is a population disparity, because poachers go for the biggest tusks. So who are they going to go after first? The males. Well, what happens when all the males are gone? You go after the biggest female. Here's the problem. The biggest female is usually the matriarch. And if you kill the matriarch in a herd, the entire society crumbles. The herd is not going to know where to find water in times of drought. They're not going to know the safest elephant corridors to keep them out of the range of poachers. Any nursing babies of that matriarch will die if they are under the age of two, if the matriarch is killed. As a result, the collateral damage from killing one matriarch can often be many elephants within the herd. Since 2008, the price of ivory has gone from 150 bucks a pound to $1,300 a pound. And the reason that I get so fired up about this is because sometimes it's really hard for Americans to know why this matters. We do not have elephants walking around in you know, our wild, in our forests. And it seems like someone else's wildlife concern. But you know what? It's actually a humanitarian concern. And here's the reason it affects you intimately. The money that comes from poaching is tied into criminal networks and terrorists. We know this for a fact. We know that Joseph Kony founded the Lord's Resistance Army with money that was raised by poaching. We know that every month, one to three tons of ivory are poached by members of Al-Shabaab in Somalia, raising $500,000 a month. Al-Shabaab has direct ties to Al-Qaeda. That's how it affects you. $500,000 a month goes a long way in Somalia, a long way towards building a terrorist network. So why is nothing getting done? Well, because in some African governments, unfortunately, the poachers and the government officials are linking arms, and uh, they're in cahoots with each other. And if you're a farmer and your family's starving and someone offers you money to kill an elephant, guess what? You go and you kill an elephant. What we need to see are incentives for governments out there to give to farmers that will allow them to have other alternatives so that they don't go and kill the local wildlife. There are, however, some strides being made. In some, South Af in some African countries, like South Africa and Kenya, the government officials did the math, and they realized the loss of money from tourism that they won't have if there are no elephants um, basically over, over superseded the problem of trying to stand against poachers. And so they began to take very proactive anti-poaching measures in those countries. So for example, South Africa uses drones to patrol its borders. And they can see where the elephants are migrating. They can see when poachers cross the border. And they can see them when they try to run away. 
And China did a terrific thing. They wound up crushing all of these stores of ivory, of illegal ivory. Instead of trying to sell it again on some kind of free world market, they destroyed it, which really set a big example in the community that um, has a demand for ivory. We also know that there are UN resolutions now against poaching, and that there are organizations like the Clinton Global Initiative, which has raised $80 million to combat poaching. So what do you do as an individual when you read the book and you fall in love with elephants? Because you're gonna, okay? <laughs> this is what I would recommend. It's threefold. The first thing that you can do is give either time or money to an organization that supports elephants. And it doesn't matter if it's an organization like Tusk Trust or the elephant sanctuary right here in your own backyard. You just want someone who has the good of elephants in their mind and in the forefront of their business. The other thing, which is easy and free and timeless, is for you all to go home and write your elected officials an email and just say that you support President Obama's ban on poaching, his initiative against it. Our elected officials need to know that it's important to individuals in this country to do something to combat poaching over in Africa. So I would urge all of you to do that after you read Leaving Time and you're dying to do something to feel better. So that would be my public service announcement for the night. Um, and uh, it really is amazing. Um, you know, I realize I had a pretty extraordinary experience because I got to go behind the scenes at the sanctuary and not everyone does. But if you ever have the great opportunity to see an elephant in the wild and to see some of the things that I've seen, just witnessed, it's really hard to erase that from your mind. I got to watch a matriarch take her herd up a hill over and over just so she could slide down it on her butt. They just were playing over and over. I saw two bulls take a dung ball and kick it back and forth like they were playing soccer. You know, there's something so beautiful about the way they interact when they are with their calves, the way they help each other. Um, they really are pretty extraordinary creatures. And uh, so I am, I'm a big supporter myself, and I hope I can encourage all of you guys to do the same. So now what I would like to do is open the floor up for your questions. The only thing that I ask, which is what I ask anytime I speak, is that you not give away the ending of this book or any of my others, because I'll have to hurt you. <laughs> so um, if anyone has a question, just raise your hand. Yeah. So was there a New England sanctuary, or is that fictional? When I started writing the book, it was entirely fictional. However, I did make sure that elephants could survive the weather in New England. And the answer is that they can. Um, in fact, there were um, armies, I think it was Attila the Hun, who used uh, elephants in his army to cross like the Himalayas and stuff in the dead of winter. Uh, but while I was writing the book, a sanctuary opened in Maine. And they had two elephants. It was a very tiny sanctuary. But they were treating it like a sanctuary setting, and they rescued two elephants in Maine, uh, which is even colder than where I live <laughs> and where I set this in New Hampshire. Um, so there, there were two elephants there. There was um, a tragedy. The guy who, set up, who created the sanctuary wound up being killed by one of their elephants. The elephants got sent back to the circus where uh, they had first been rescued from. And I actually was speaking today to Mary Beth at the Elephant Sanctuary here, and they are in discussions to try to bring those elephants to the sanctuary, which would be really great. Anyone else? I can't see you. Yes, wave if I can't see you. In the front row, you're kind of dark. I was wondering if you had followed the um, uh, journey of Anne Douglas Hamilton and his daughter, Seba Hamilton Douglas, in Africa. They were using some quite advanced uh, methods to track uh, the trajectory of the elephant. Mm -hmm. and how they had destroyed many people and they found you know, things like beehives and that kind of thing would keep them away. H have you fought, fought? I did do a little the questions about whether I read or followed Ian Douglas Hamilton and his work. I did more with Joyce Poole's work because I was specifically looking at empathy. And she actually has many scientific papers about cognition and empathy in elephants. So although I know of his work, I didn't study it exclusively. Sure. Yeah. My mom just retired from 36 years of teaching. Cool. And it was really hard for both of us to read 19 minutes. Uh -huh. When you wrote that, was it 
hard for, was it dramatic for you? Were you crying in the middle of it? <laughs> <laughs> was it hard for me to write 19 minutes? Um, for those of you who don't know that book, it's about a school shooting in a small New England town. Um, you know, and school shootings happen in the most unlikely places, like your backyard. Uh, and it was a really hard book to write, mostly because I wrote it as a response to the fact that Columbine had happened, and I was thinking about bullying. And I was thinking when I was um, when I was in middle school, I was bullied. I was like a smart kid. They used to call me a brainy heck. And you know, I ate lunch with like the teachers. I was that kid. And uh, <laughs> and at one point, I I was in reaching up into a locker, and a kid walked by and slammed the locker on my hand and called me you know some name or something. And he broke two of my fingers. So that was way back in the 80s, right, or late 70s. And um, then my kids grew up, right, you know, and they all were bullied at different points in their lives in different ways. And it was post-Columbine, and I was like, really? I mean, like, have we learned nothing from this? And it really upset me. So that's what I really wanted to write about, what happens when schools take bullying and sweep it under the carpet and say, no, no, everything's fine here, and they don't address it proactively. What happens is, of course, school violence. And um, what made that book very hard was that my children were the same age as the kids in the book. And very rarely have I written that. Most of the time, if I'm writing about teenagers, my kids were younger or older. But here, they were right in the thick of it. And um, you know, that was, that was scary. Um, you know, for me, that book was also about recognizing that the shooter has a family, too, and seeing what that family feels like in the aftermath. Um, and understanding that very often in a cycle of bullying, the bully and the victim have more in common than they have apart. Um, one of the things I'm really, really proud about about that book is that it's taught in hundreds of school districts as curriculum. And I love that. Uh, and I have had probably the most amazing experiences of my entire career going into schools and talking to kids about that book. There was this one school in New Hampshire that I went to, and uh, the, um, th we had this assembly. It was like a one book, one community thing, so everyone read the book. And then we did a Q&A like this, and this kid comes up, and he, he raises his hand, and he goes, yeah, um, I just wanted to tell you all that I actually brought a gun to school in my backpack this fall, and I was going to kill some of you. And so, you know, the principal standing next to me on stage, and he's like, right? <laughs> and, um, and he went on to say, you know, he was overweight, and he said he's been bullied for years, and, and he, the reason he didn't do it, he said, was because that day he was assigned this book to read, and he realized he wasn't the only one. And then another girl, I swear, I did not plant them, but another girl <laughs> raises her hand, and it's a girl who is sitting in a wheelchair, and she said, yeah, um, so I came home one day, and I was in tears, and I told my mother that I'm invisible, that nobody sees me, no one interacts with me, nobody talks to me in the school. And I was starting to come up with a way to kill myself. And that night, because I couldn't figure it out, I just decided to do my English homework. And it was to read the first chapter of 19 Minutes, and instead I stayed up and I read the whole book, and you're the reason I'm still alive. So when you hear stuff like that, you know, no matter how hard a book is to write, you realize that was the right book to write. Someone else? Yeah. Um, a lot of your books have legal trials in them. Does this one include it, and how did you get the inspiration for that? For trials or for this book? The um, So a lot of my books have trials in them. Does this have a trial in it? Yes, The Elephant's the Prosecutor. I'm kidding. It's not. <laughs> um, there is no trial in this book. It's funny, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, she only writes legal books. I'm like, really? No, I don't. You know, sometimes people only read my legal books, but there are a lot of my books that don't have trials in them, and this is one of them. Um, and uh, when, I, when I write a book about the law, it's because I have learned something so ridiculous that I want to teach it to all of you. Because let's face it, most of you know your law from Law & Order SVU, right? So, you know, I really want to illuminate all the weird loopholes in the law. So, for example, when I wrote The Pact, which is a legal book, um, I had learned that I would never be called to testify against my husband in court, but I would be called to testify against one of my children. And I thought, that's ridiculous, because I would be much more likely to put my husband away than any of my kids, <laughs> right? And, 
So I created a situation where that had to happen, where a woman basically was put on the stand and either had to perjure herself or incriminate her own child. And um, you know, that became part of, of the pact. So those are the kinds of things I try to do when I write a legal trial. <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, it's kind of a two-fold question. Okay. Is your inspiration always something from around you, mm -hmm. personal? And two, do you research everything that you write about in one aspect or another, and how much time do you invest in that research? So I'm going to answer the second question first. I do research everything that I write about, like literally everything. I researched ghost hunting because I didn't even want anyone to tell me you got it wrong. So I'm very serious about my research, and sometimes it takes me more time to do the research than it does to physically write a first draft. That depends, though, on the story and on the way it's being told. Um, this story was a nightmare to physically write. It was very hard to write, and I will not tell you why until you've read it. Then it will all become clear to you. But it was, it was a very difficult book from the, a writing standpoint. And honestly, in terms of the research standpoint, um, in addition to going to the Elephant Sanctuary and going to Botswana, which were very concentrated trips, and reading a lot of background studies that were done by elephant researchers, I also met in Atlanta with a psychic to learn more about how Serenity thinks, and I worked with a detective to learn how Virgil would think and how to put together a cold case. So those were all the threads that I had to weave together when I created the book. Um, then, in terms of what inspires me, uh, I am really lucky. I have an amazing life. I live in a great area of the US. I have the best husband on the planet. I have three happy, healthy children. I have four great dogs. You know, I really do live a charmed life. And I am so grateful that I do not live the lives of my characters who are all miserable, <laughs> right? And, but you know, that said, there are reasons I've written the things that I write. And sometimes I think about it. You know, there's no shortage of, um, of controversial topics out there. But the things I write about are the things that are keeping me up at night, things that I worry about as a wife, as a woman, as an American, uh, as a mother. You know, And because of that, they are very personally linked to me. If you look at the trajectory of my career, my very first book was Songs of the Humpback Whale. It was really the last mother-daughter book that I wrote before leaving time. I was closer in age to the daughter than I was to the mother. That is not true this time around, sadly. Um, but then I got married. And so I started to write about relationships between men and women. I wrote about what it's like to be a young mother. I wrote about what it was like to be in a relationship. Is it ever 50-50? Then I had kids. And for many, many years, all I wrote about were the really scary things that could happen to your kids, because that's what was terrifying me all the time. And then my kids got older, and I was like, OK. I can handle this. And I sort of extrapolated back to a book like Lone Wolf, which is about end of life care. Who gets to decide how we die? Or a book like The Storyteller, What's the Nature of Good and Evil? Right? And then all of a sudden, my daughter gets up to go to college, and boom, I'm right back in the middle of leaving time. So there is a trajectory to the things that I write about, and they do intersect with my life at different points. And what seems like a great idea right now might not have been a good idea five years ago because of that. And I always joke around and tell my mom that surely I'm going to be writing about putting your parents in a rest home. She's not happy about that. <laughs> yes? Um, I have two questions. One, pro-circus or anti-circus? Oh, anti. OK. The other is, can you tell us a little bit about your writing process? Mm -hmm. Do you sort of put together an outline? How do you sort of figure out what you're going to do? OK, so here's my circus and zoo speech, just so you know. Elephants should not ever be in captivity, ever. Even in a sanctuary, you know, you've got 2,700 acres at Hohenwald, and they have tons of room. That's still not as much room as they would cover if they were in Savannah somewhere. And um, the problem, of course, with circuses, too, is that they're being, they're being trained to do behaviors that are not natural for them or normal. And that also happens in zoo settings. You know, we see a lot of weird sort of stress-related behaviors, even when it looks like elephants are being treated kindly at a zoo, which is not always the case. And even if they have like the best care ever at a zoo, they're still probably going to develop foot problems, you know, because they're not, they're on concrete more than they are on rocky ground, which would help um, their feet and the pads of their feet. So there are all sorts of issues with keeping elephants in captivity. The zoos that I have the most respect for are the ones that say, you know what, 
we see the point here, and when our elephant dies, we're not gonna get another elephant, or we're donating our elephants to a sanctuary or something like that. Those are the ones that I really think have seen the light. The real issue with zoos and circuses is that, um, you know, circuses are, are us, using elephants for our own entertainment, which is not very kind, especially given what you know now about the way that they think and grieve. Um, and zoos really existed as a way for us here outside of Africa and India to learn about and see elephants. We don't need that anymore. You guys can go click on a video on Facebook and see an elephant playing in the ocean, you know, when, any time. We don't really need what zoos used to provide for us. And for those people who say, well, elephants in zoos have um, breeding programs, well, far more elephants die in zoos than, than are bred. So that's just not a viable answer anymore. So yes, if you can get all elephants out of captivity, it would be a very happy day. Um, I have no idea what you asked me before. The, oh, my writing schedule, right. Sorry, I was getting all impassioned. Um, so uh, the, um, the writing schedule, um, I tend to tour for about three months a year, which gives me nine months a year to write a book, and that's from the conception of an idea to the end of the first draft, roughly. And when I write, I get up at about 5.30 in the morning, I go for a three-mile walk with a friend of mine, we gossip the whole way. Then I come home, take a shower, and I answer fan mail for about an hour. I get about 200 fan letters a day via email. Via email. I read and answer each one of them. I do not have an assistant. If you got a response back, it really is me. And then I um, pull up whatever I was writing the day before, and I edit my way through it. And when I get to the bottom of it, I just keep writing. And I usually stay up there until about 3.30. If I'm lucky, my husband brings me coffee or food, and then I magically turn into a wife and mother again. That's, that's basically how it works. The actual book, how do I map out the book? I am not one of these people who does very, very detailed outlines. I have a one-page outline. I know the high points. But what I tend to work off of um, are the, the uh, transcripts that I do from my research. You know, when I interviewed people at the sanctuary, I came home with over 200 pages of transcript. I had about 500 pages after being in Botswana for a week. And I read through all that, I mark it up, because I go, oh, that, I know where that's going in the book. And I cross-reference it with these crazy little post-its, so that when I'm in the middle of writing that scene, I can grab it, look at the research, and say, yes, I remember, and then write that scene. So that tends to be how I work. I know the beginning and the end of a story. I don't know what happens in the middle. The characters are the ones that do that. Yeah. I love all of your books that I've read. Thank you. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the trajectory, like you said, yeah. the things pop up in your life. What would you say to you is the, the common overarching theme to your novel? Are you writing out the paper? No, no. <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> I think the overarching theme to my books is that we never know people as well as we think we do. That tends to crop up a lot. Uh, recently, you've written a book with your daughter. Yes! And um, what was that experience like? And uh, do you think she will become so this, the legacy? This question is a great one. I love talking about this. Um, it's about the book that I co wrote with my daughter, Sammy. Samantha was 13 years old when she called me up on book tour and she said, I think I have a really good idea for a book. And I said, All right, hit me. And she said, Well, what if every time you closed a book, the characters inside it had lives and personalities totally different from the roles that they played? But every time someone opened it again, they had to jump back to Act One, Scene One. And what if there was this prince in a fairy tale who was so totally sick of being a prince in a fairy tale, but no one noticed him as anything but the prince until there was this 15 year old girl? who was kind of a loner and a big reader, and she was obsessed with the children's fairy tale because the prince who was illustrated in it was really attractive. And one day she realized he was talking to her and he wanted out of that book. And I thought, she's brilliant, you know? <laughs> And uh, you know, it's funny because I, what I thought immediately was that we have all had literary crushes, right? I'm actually carrying mine on book tour. This is Jamie Fraser from Outlander, right here. He's mine, don't you clap for him, right? So 
But, you know, <laughs> there's always somebody that we dream about, whether it's Mr. Darcy or, you know, the dude from Twilight, whatever it is. You just, you think about that person coming for you, and those are the perfect men. And what if you could create that in a book, and what if he could be with you? So that became the driving plot for Between the Lines. And I said to Sammy, do you want to write this together? And she was like, okay, because she had no idea what she was getting into. And we spent the next four summers working on that book. We plotted the first summer. The second summer, we wrote the first draft. The second summer, we edited it. And the third summer, it was published, and we went on tour across three continents to promote it. So of all of my, my whole family, really, Sammy's the only one who knows what I do on a daily basis, intimately, from start to finish. And writing with her was a really interesting experience because she's very bright. She is incredibly imaginative and creative. Of all my kids, she's definitely the one who's always been the most creative. Um, but, she, I mean, she wouldn't know a comma if it hit her between the eyes, you know, for example. <laughs> but on the other hand, like, she's got the nuts and bolts of dialogue and character and all of that down. And I really, we, we literally would sit side by side at my computer and one of us would type. And we spoke every word of that book out loud. Just I would say a sentence, and then she would say a sentence. And sometimes we would say the same sentence and look at each other like, that's creepy. You know, but that happened a lot. And there were times that we argued constantly. Um, she wanted the prince to be blonde, for example. And I was like, no, he's got dark hair. I won. Um, but then there were things she, she won. Uh, for example, there are all these little snippets of the fairy tale that are woven through the book, and I wanted them to be very tongue-in-cheek and funny, and she said, absolutely not. They have to be really dark and gothic, like Grimm's fairy tales, because that's the only way you can see what Oliver really has at stake if he stays in this book. And I thought, all right, we'll write it your way, and then I'm thinking, when you go to school, I'm going to change it. <laughs> and she actually was dead right, and I never changed a word. And so I had to really learn to trust her instincts that way. So the first book was published. We had a really great time on tour. It was a lot of fun. And she got asked every night, are you going to be a writer? And she said, God, no, it's too hard. <laughs> so then she went to college, right? You know, that was where leaving time came in, right in the middle. And she went off to Vassar, and she called me January of her freshman year. And she goes, I really miss writing. And I said, you write every day. And she goes, yeah, but I don't really write. And she said, um, maybe we could write the sequel to Between the Lines this summer, and maybe I could get course credit for it. <laughs> and I told you she was really smart. So she did, she got course credit, we wrote a sequel, and it's coming out in May, it's called Off the Page. And it's great, we love it. Um, it was an even more fun experience, because she's a much more um, confident writer now, she does know what a comma is, and, um, and she fought even harder for what, you know, what she wanted the story to be like, and it turned out to be great. Um, the other great news that's super exciting about Between the Lines is that we are currently developing those books into a Broadway musical. So you can keep your eyes peeled for that too. Yes? You said that you weave reality into a lot of your research and what bothers you and keeps you up at night. How do you separate your research from your life and not let it keep you bogged down. That is so easy for me because honestly, um, my research and my books are so different from my life. You know, I really, a lot of my characters, I just want to throttle and go, wake up already, you know? But they'd be really short books if I did that, you know? And so I, I can leave my office at the end of the day and what I go home to, what I go downstairs to is so different than the trauma these characters are living that honestly, I, I have no trouble separating at all. I do have characters who sometimes wake me up in the middle of the night talking, you know, and I'll get up and I'll write something down and then I'll go back to sleep. But other than that, I, I have no trouble separating them. Yes? Um, you brought up literary pressure, so I have to ask. Um, <laughs> Ian Fletcher. Is, yes. My, my sister and I have a huge, huge literary He's pressure. married now. He's happily married. So excited that you pop back in for those, like, pages. <laughs> So that brings up two questions. A, will he be back? And <laughs> B, um, what prompts you to bring your parents mm. into the prompt novel? That's a great question. Um, will Ian Fletcher be back? Um, possibly. You know, he came back because I was thinking to myself, what would a guy who was a confirmed atheist who wound up meeting and falling for the mother of, you know, a girl who was basically a miracle turn out like? And I decided he would clearly become an expert in all religions. <laughs> and so he came back as that on the stand for a different book. Um, I don't know if he'll be back. I guess if I write another novel that delves into the religious versus the spiritual, there's a role for him, so possibly. Uh, but I'm sorry, I mean, he's probably gonna stay with Mariah, so you may wanna get over that. Okay, all right. I'm just, I'm trying to help you. I'm just trying to help you. 
Um, but uh, what forces me to bring a character back is someone whose story I feel I haven't finished telling yet. So Jordan McAfee is a great example of that. He was an attorney in the pact. He came back in 19 minutes and Salem Falls as well because there were elements of his life that I still wanted to explore. Um, in 19 minutes, I really brought him back because I had someone who needed a client, uh, who was a client who needed an attorney who could practice in New Hampshire, and Jordan was free, so that's why he came back. <laughs> but, um, but like someone like Patrick Ducharme, who was in Perfect Match, and then came back in 19 minutes, the reason he comes back as a detective is because I have a crush on him, and I just want to see him again, you know, so it's nice to revisit him. Um, there are characters that I think about all the time. The one who I imagine will probably come back one day is Chris Hart. I wonder what happened to him from the pact. So I'm sure you'll see him at some point. Oh, great, because that was my favorite of your books. Oh, good. Well, maybe you can move on to him. I don't know if he's dating anyone yet. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Do you have a favorite novel of yours? Yes, I do. Um, my favorite novel, my personal favorite novel, is um, Second Glance. It's for many reasons that are very writerly. Uh, it was um, about a period of American history when, that most people don't know even existed, when we were in the business of racial hygiene prior to Hitler in this country. And it also had the coolest research I've ever done in my life, which was going ghost hunting. So for those two reasons, I just love it. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now? Sure. Um, so like I said, what am I working on now? The next book that you're gonna see is called Off the Page, and it's the sequel to the young adult novel Between the Lines. And that's gonna come out on my birthday, actually, May 19th. Um, and uh, the book that I'm working on, the next adult novel that I'm working on, is a book about race in this country. Um, it is a, a conversation that has become very important to me and my family. I think it is a dialogue that we really need to have in this country, and I'm really excited about bringing it to my readers. Um, it is a really intense book and a really important book, so I'm very psyched about writing that one when I get back home. It's more of a comment than a question, but I just wanted to tell you that in House Rules, Jacob is exactly like my cousin. Nailed him. Thank you. It was so well written. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I really admire the way that you like write each chapter from a different character's perspective. Mm. So I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. Is there something that like sparked you to start using that in all of your books? Yeah. Um, the reason I like to write from multiple first-person points of view is twofold. First of all, it keeps me on my toes. You should be able to open the page of any of my books written that way and be able to know which character is speaking, you know, without me telling you who it is, because they all do have to sound fundamentally different. But in addition to that, I write a lot about very controversial topics. And when you have multiple first-person narratives, you allow your narrators to present all the different sides of the argument. So for example, if you read Sing You Home, you might be going into this thinking that you are, you know, um, you are a conservative Christian like Pastor Clive and Max, and your point of view might resonate with theirs when it comes to homosexuality. But then you might read Zoe's piece or Vanessa's piece and think, oh, actually, maybe I need to rethink my opinion. So instead of me telling you what you should think, as an author, I let each of my narrators plead their case to you. And then it's up to you to figure out who's right or who's wrong, if you even can. In the back. Do you have a short story in Winter Snow? Yes. Talked about Serenity yes. and the character. Was that planned before the time, or did she just talk out to you and she felt that you needed to tell them? So perhaps some of you noticed that it's not March, and my books usually come out in March. And um, that's because I switched publishers this year. And Random House, who is my beloved new wonderful publisher, decided they wanted to try something different. They really wanted to publish me in the fall, which was really a very nice feather in my cap because the biggest books in America come out in, in this season. So that meant they believed in it very strongly. Um, and so they said, we're gonna publish you instead you know, in October. And I said, my fans are going to lose it because they're so used to getting a book in March. And so they came up with this idea that maybe what I could do is write a short story that could come out before leaving time, but that could kind of get you excited about leaving time. So the first short story that I wrote was actually um, Larger Than Life. 
And it is a prequel to Alice Metcalf's story in Leaving Time. It tells you about how she became an elephant researcher studying cognition and grief in Africa the first time she was there as a doctoral student. You do not, by the way, have to read the short stories in order to enjoy Leaving Time. You don't ever have to read them. If you do, it gives you a very, a, a very three-dimensional feeling, I think, for these characters. But I wrote this short story, and Random House read it, and they said, oh my god, we ask people to do this all the time, but no one's ever done it this seamlessly. So we want to publish this really close to the publication of the book to kind of get people super excited. They wanted to publish it at the end of the summer. And I said, that's not going to help my readers in March. And they said, write something else. <laughs> so. I went back and I decided to tell Serenity's backstory. So you heard me as Serenity talk about what happened with Senator McCoy's son and how she basically lied when he was on her TV show and said he was alive and well and that didn't go well for her. The story of that is actually uh, where there's smoke. And it was given away as a free gift to all of you. You can actually go download it from my website. It's a PDF and you can read it whenever you want, you know, if you feel like doing that and you're bored after leaving time or before, whatever. But the idea was just to give you, um, to get you as pumped up about these characters as I was, honestly, because uh, I've been waiting to give this book to you for so long now, you know, because um, I would have loved for you to read it in the spring, but we were delaying it for a very good reason, and I wanted you to, to get excited with me. Um, how about, like, three more questions? Yes. Are there some titles that you didn't finish and you put them aside and then So I, there's one book that I never wrote. I was about 100 pages into it, and I, I was giving chapters to my mom and my agent who read it like in serial form that way, and they were both like, oh, this is really good. I can't wait to read more of it. And it was. It was a good book, you know? It just wasn't a great book. It was a good book, but not a great book. And the whole time I was writing it, I kept hearing this voice in my head, and she said, I was six years old the first time I disappeared. I was six years old the first time I disappeared. She kept saying it over and over. And finally, I was just so sick of her that I sat down one morning at my computer and I wrote 40 pages in her voice in about an hour. And I went, oh, that's the book I'm supposed to be writing. And that was Vanishing Acts. I wrote that instead and I took the other book and I threw it out because it was a good book, but it wasn't a great book. Yes? Are there any topics that you will not write about? Are there any topics I will not write about? Given the fact that I've decided to tackle race in contemporary America, I'm going to say no. <laughs> and last question, yes. What's the process when you make a film? How involved are you with the writers and the actors and what gets left in or left out? What's my process when I make a film? Um, I always think I'm going to get out of an event without hearing that question, but there it is. Um, so. Honestly, it, it does depend. I had uh, very good fortune with my TV movies. I have always been asked to go to the set. I have been asked to meet with the actors. I've been asked to rewrite scenes on the fly as they're about to film them. They've always been really generous. Um, the Lifetime, which filmed all of them, were, they were great to me. Um, I had a little less joy with the experience of My Sister's Keeper. Um, that book was bought by New Line Cinema. And the thing that most people don't realize about the transition of uh, book to film is that traditionally the writer has nothing to do with it. You're supposed to sell your book and walk away. It is like giving a baby up for adoption. You really hope you're giving it to a great home. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes she becomes a prostitute. You never know. <laughs> and honestly, that's what happened to me with my sister's keeper. You know, I was. Um, I was writing it, uh, I sold it to New Line Cinema, they asked me to meet with Nick Cassavetes before he was hired as a director, and I did, and I said to him, the only thing that matters to me is that you keep the ending. It's what sold millions of copies of this book. People would go, I can't tell you what happened, just read it. And, right, and people were going, yeah, mm -hmm, that's what I did. So Nick read it, and he said, you know, you're right, that's the only ending, I'm not gonna change it, and if someone does, I'm gonna tell you why, and I'm gonna tell you myself. And I thought, totally fair. So he spent two years writing a script, and he would call me weekly, and he would ask for help with dialogue and with character, and I was always available to him. And he wrote a script that looked a lot like the book, enough like the book. And then I got an email from a fan who worked at a casting agency, and she said, did you know they changed the ending of My Sister's Keeper? So I called Nick at home, and he wouldn't take my phone call. So I flew to the movie set, and he threw me off the set. So I went to New Line Cinema, and I marched into Toby Emmerich's office, and I said, you're gonna lose money on this film because I have rabid fans and this is not what they wanna see. 
And they said, oh, no, no, no. We think we know what we're doing. Nick Cassavetes, you know, he made the notebook for us. And I said, OK. And I walked away. And they lost money on the film. They lost a lot of money on it, because you're all wonderful. And so ironically, as a result of that experience, I actually now have more creative control over my products, only because the only thing that speaks in Hollywood is money. And I was psychic enough to say, you're going to lose money. And since I was right, they're like, oh, she must know something now. So um, the other books that have been you know, in different pipelines, they have asked me to have more creative control. That is not even an option I would have had with my sister's keeper or if my sister's keeper had been a success. So it's actually a really, you know, it's a weird process. And look, the book is always better than the movie. <laughs> and I don't want to end on that one, so I'm taking one more question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is my biggest struggle as a writer? That's a good question. Um, you know, I would say it's twofold. One is a self-imposed struggle. I know there are not a lot of writers who do this, and that's not true. There are a lot of writers who do this. There's some that don't, but I actually take very seriously the, the fact that you spend money on my books and that you deserve a really great read that not only entertains you, but hopefully educates you. And that's why if I'm writing a good book, it's not good enough. It's got to be great. So I feel a lot of pressure to give you the best book I can at that moment, you know, not to phone it in. And I think, honestly, a lot of writers who probably are lucky enough to be successful sometimes are like, I'm going to phone this one in. You know, just because it's easier. It's, it's hard work to be a writer. So I, I feel a lot of internal pressure, even after 23 novels, to like really outdo myself when I write. And it's really nice when you notice. <laughs> and uh, I'd say the other thing that's really, really, really hard is keeping myself from going to Amazon and Goodreads to read nasty reviews. That is so hard. Every year I go, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. And I do it every year. And you know, it kills me. It kills me that there are trolls out there who are like, yeah, I hate her. I'm giving her one star. Or yeah, you know what? $1.99, that was too expensive for this 80-page short story. I'm like, really? What else can you buy for $1.99? You know, so I'm giving you one star. And it's just really hard you know, to not take it personally. I think the internet is a, a brilliant thing because it's created a community of fans for me. I love my internet fans. I love my Facebook fans. I interact with them on Twitter all the time. You know, and I love the fact, too, that my fans talk to each other. That's awesome. I, you know, that's very, very cool and not something that always happens for writers. So the internet has brought the world a little closer and the, your fans a little closer. But it also means that people who post comments are divorced from responsibility. Many of them don't even sign their own names to you know, the profiles that they choose. And because of that, they say really mean, hurtful things, forgetting that there's a human reading them. You know, and that's, that's a really good lesson, I think, for anyone to remember. Kindness goes really far in this world. And you know, I would urge, there, look, I don't have to hear that you loved my book. You can certainly say, ah, this one wasn't my favorite. I can support that. But you can do it in a way that's constructive and kind without being really nasty. So that's what I, I aim for. I hope that maybe I can leave the world a slightly better place so that you know, when people go to post on Amazon, they're a little nicer when they leave their comments. <laughs> that's it. Um, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Uh, I look forward to coming back to Nashville. And I really appreciate you being here. Thanks a lot.